This is the Drew Spirians, the show that's 80% combat sports and 20% everything else. The show is brought to you by three, th- three ad reads. First, KRT, Karate Tips and Tricks with <clears throat> Sensei's Wesley Jensen and Darren Stringer, bringing the minds of Kyokushin Karate, Taekwondo, Muay Thai, Dutch kickboxing, any stand-up martial art together in the uh, largest online growing dojo during the pandemic to bridge martial arts together because no matter the style you speak, martial arts is one language. The other, uh, the other ad read is brought to you by Kyokushin Shuffle Podcast with uh, Sensei Pat Pinto, picking uh, where he has on kickboxing and Kyokushin minds uh, to see what gets them to excel at their craft, as well as his ebook Forever the Student, available online, where, where he posts some of his most memorable interviews in book format. And lastly, finding a good manager is very hard in today's fight game. Luckily, there's Moments Management, where Nima Safapur and his team who have represented clients such as Alex Gustafson, Gegard Mousasi, Pani Kianzad, Costello Van Stennis, to name just a few of the many, are, be- have definitely, uh, are definitely, is definitely one management company I would recommend since uh, they will teach you how to manage your money, invest your money, and understand the fight game during your fight career. But tonight, it's most important is the guest I have because I've been wanting to have this guy on for such a long time. The, the amount, every time I try to message him, the timing just wasn't right, but he agreed to it. So I got to get, so I have to be honest there, but now we can finally do it. He works with TriStar MMA. He is the brains behind the amateur scene, really helping build the amateur pipeline, understands the amateur scene like clockwork. He's a, and I would say he has a PhD in understanding how to build an amateur fighter to get them ready for the pros. I am super honored to be joined tonight by coach Rob Rivet. Welcome, Rob. Thank you very much, man. It's a pleasure to be here, Drew. Thank you. Uh, thank you, man. It's such an honor to have you. I'm, I remember the first time like we spoke in person when I came by uh, by invitation with uh, from Sandro and he uh, and like we were speaking and I was like, man, like it's like the way you're talking about the amateur scene, like in our little small talk is really like stuck with me to this day still. Uh, yeah, dude, it's it's a it's a very fickle scene in Montreal. It, it's strange. We have some of the most incredible MMA gyms and MMA coaches and fighters in in Canada and yet it is illegal it, it is illegal to to be an amateur fighter in Quebec so it's uh, it's it's pretty interesting because we have guys working so hard to try to get to the you know the next level and um, they're having to fight on you know reserves still in 2021 fighting on you know native reserves and um, essentially underground style you know type of fights it's 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 pretty silly so it's it's interesting it's interesting yeah because before that there was tko but then tko folded i mean i don't know the stories you know i just heard like they they were it was kind of giving up and comers a platform like and then it just disappeared so (laughs) <laughs> what, so I don't know if you know anything, but I mean, since it folded, what do you think is the next step for the amateur scene? Because you just said it, we have such a, a we have so much talent, but it's legal and that doesn't make sense still to, to both to the both of us. Yeah, it's uh, it's special. Like we were talking about before, the Quebec government, it's special on all, all fronts. Uh, but coming back to TKO, yeah, if you know who the the owner or the the head promoter owner matchmaker of TKO is it's uh, Stéphane Petri and if you don't know the history of him I mean that could be a whole other podcast that man he uh, he's been involved in in fighting in Quebec for the last twenty five years and mm-hmm. he's yeah well he's special so <laughs> it goes up it goes down it goes in it goes out who knows but there's a lot of backstory to that uh, and. It's sad because it's gone now again, and that was the only local uh, professional MMA promotion. So that was kind of, like you said, a great stepping stone for for the local amateur guys because it was also on Fight Pass. So you got guys who were fighting local shows, amateur shows, and the next thing you know, they're fighting pro, and then they're on a world world level, world scene. They're being on UFC Fight Pass. So that was a pretty amazing exposure. But uh, it's no longer around, so it's kind of sad. That being said, you're going to have to start looking probably out west again. There's Battlefield Fight League. There's a, few, there's a few promotions out west that are looking to start going again. I know I've heard a few things. Um, so they're going to start looking to, 
to get shows running again. But besides that, the 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 pro scene in Canada isn't very uh, isn't very strong. So it's it's tough, man. It's a it's still a tough game. Like it, being a fighter. It's such it's such a shame because after George Saint Pierre left, like like. Uh, we would have thought that there, he would have left behind the ne- the the a nest egg of the next generation, like with like uh, and like there were some that made it, but there's that expectation replicate what George did. But the thing is, you can't do that. It's like he left such like shoes to fill. Yeah, yeah, huge huge ones. You know, and I think every Canadian fighter is still trying to fill those shoes, and there's there's they're always gonna every every time there's a Canadian fighter on on a UFC card, there's always gonna be the well, it's just the next GSP kind of deal, you know, it's, and I think that goes, it's, it's amazing that he was able to kind of create that legacy behind him, but, you know, it's like a parent trying to make their, their kid live through them. It's not really possible. No one's ever going to duplicate George. Like you said, everyone has to kind of find their own style with MMA. That's what makes it cool as well. Um, but George was special because not because of his fighting, just because of the person that he is. And he was only, he was only able to, to do what he did and and defend those titles that many times and and do do everything that he'd done because of the person he was and there's not many people like George I mean it's he's he's a, he's a special dude in inside and outside of the cage you know he's such an amazing person and yeah that's it's gonna be tough for someone to fill those <laughs> I definitely agree and uh, before you became the coach at TriStar. What was uh, what were you doing before that? Like, what was uh, like? How did you end up getting into combat sports? I started. I started, you know, when I was younger, playing every other sport there was except for like martial arts. I always wanted to train. I got. I was big into anime when I was really young, and I started like wanting to be a ninja. You know, from a very young age, I thought it was just the coolest thing in the world. But I'm from Southern Ontario, and martial arts definitely not big back then they're growing now but then there was just not much of a scene so it wasn't really normal to to put your kids into there was probably a karate school in my town but useless you know and so i played other the sports and then once i got into high school i started wrestling i enjoyed it to some extent it was really hard wrestling's hard like wrestling is like the most hard you know the most difficult mm-hmm. martial art out there so like it, it was fun my friends were doing it but i didn't take it as serious I learned the basics and I wrestled through high school and that was that. And then I got into university. That's when I started training Muay Thai and I was doing it for fun. And then I enjoyed it, but it wasn't anything like crazy. Then I moved to Montreal when I was 21. And then I really started training and I jumped into it heavy. I started training like five, six hours a day. I became obsessed. Um, and I was studying teaching in school, so I was I was learning how to how to teach, and it just it kind of put the two together. It was I, I got great feedback from training partners very early on, and I said, you know what, I I, I enjoy it. I enjoyed kind of passing on the knowledge. I enjoyed showing people, you know, martial arts. It was, and I enjoyed doing it. It, it was like okay, I enjoy doing this so much, and I enjoy showing someone and they enjoy what I'm showing them. That feels good. This kind of makes sense. Let's roll with this. And then I started competing a lot. I started also working on different certifications for coaching. I also started going to Thailand then as well. And, um, and just trying to just soak up as much knowledge as I possibly could. You know, I was just beyond obsessed. I think for like the, for those first four or five years, I went to kind of Thailand every year and I, I just didn't, I didn't stop. I didn't stop training. It was like I would, I would miss maybe I don't know, two or three days a month where I wouldn't train, and I wouldn't even go back to Ontario to visit family or anything. I just became crazy obsessed, and it just kind of snowballed, snowballed from there. I was originally at a gym called Gamma mm-hmm. with BTT Canada. Um, that was my first team. And then Fabio Holanda, he left to open up his own sector of BTT. And then when he left, I kind of went with him for a little bit. And then uh, all my friends had gone to TriStar at this point. Uh, Xavier Louis and Alex Morgan, we were all fighting amateur together at that time. And they were always telling me to come to TriStar. And finally, one day, Ben Laliv as well, who used to be the matchmaker for Fight Quest, he also 
was telling me to come. And then I said, okay, I'll go. And I walked in on a pro sparring day and I'll never forget that. And I walked in and uh, I got introduced to Fraz. And anytime he meets you for the first time, he's doing stuff. He puts his arm around you. He's like, walk with me. You know, it's a classic for as he takes you, he walks, he walks with you and asks you the questions he needs to ask you. But I had a cool conversation with him and he welcomed me with open arms that day. He goes, listen, if you work well with the guys, the guy work, guys work well with you, you're more than welcome to come and train. And I never left. And then it, the rest is history. That that's awesome. And like, and like, I want to just take it back to anime because you said because I mean that's what got me into because the thing is like I always want I did martial arts but I did YMCA karate so it was like the really bullshit karate so <laughs> oh man like it was it's, it's like it's like it's like yeah like it's like yes I do Kyokushin but it's like before that when I was seven years old I watched Dragon Ball Z. And it was when Goku went Super Saiyan for the first time. I said, I want to do karate. My mom put me in YMCA karate. And I was like, okay, I quit after a week because the guy didn't know what, I didn't know what I was doing in there and it didn't feel authentic. But uh, what was your, what were your animes other than Dragon Ball Z? Because back in the 90s, like, I think that was the golden era for like anime. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, it was, I mean, now it's still kind of raw, but it's not even close to what it was. It's like 90s mainstream cartoons, how we were watching. They were, they were crazy back then. Now, if you show that to kids these days, obviously, look what's happening with cancel culture, right? Like, it's a little crazy. But, um, but yeah, they, they were just so crazy raw back then that I was watching these crazy anime when I was like 8, 9, 10. And my parents thought I was watching cartoons. They didn't know. <laughs> no, and there's like dudes getting their heads like like ninja scroll like i'll never forget the first time i saw ninja scroll like it blew my mind open like there's so many crazy things in that in that movie and all the all the hayao miyazaki movies like the older ones like nashika in the valley of the wind princess mononoke like the older ones those really were big for me um what older ones were there did you ever watch bio hunter no, I, I was, I was really only I and still still am. I'm only into anime and manga that is like samurai and ninja. Okay, okay. Like like that's it. That's all. Some like martial arts, samurai, ninja. That's it. No mecha, no robots. Okay. No, no silly like balloons over their head with facial oh, okay. expression. I can't. I can't. Did you? Oh, did you watch Roni Kenshin? Maybe. Yeah. So Kenshin and. What was the other one? Inuyasha yeah. as well. All amazing. Uh, another one was called Shiguri. I don't know if you never heard of it. It's it is insane. It was a, it was a manga they turned into like a an anime. It was it's a crazy one as well. Um, and then like later on, like Samurai Champloo, Samurai Seven, and as and, and also all the all the old. Um, kurosawa films like i used to watch those when i was younger and like i just thought those were the most badass movies out there you know so those those were my for for me it was dragon ball z inuyasha roni kenshin especially kenshin because i think yeah. shishio makoto like the one of the guy with the mummified bandages is like forever yeah. It's like when you're young, you're watching it for the actions. But when you get older and you listen to his philosophy, like with martial arts and life, like you yeah. understand, like, like you want, like, I think with anime, you learn to like the villains and the antiheroes more because the creators make them relatable, like to real life. That's what you realize yeah. when you're older. Yeah. Well, and like my all time favorite is Naruto. Like Naruto is my all time favorite times a hundred. Like nothing will, will top it. I watched that the whole time from the first freaking episode until like the whole 15 years it ran, you know, that one for, for me, it was just like, I think it motivated me so much just to be a ninja all the time. Just cause like, it was just him trying to be the best ninja ever. And it just, it was too, it was too badass. I loved it. And Sasuke was my guy growing up. I liked, I liked Sasuke. No one liked Sasuke. I liked Sasuke. I thought he was badass. <laughs> I only, I remember watching Naruto because I used to get the Shonen Jump from my mom. And so I, luckily, like, I had very liberal parents. Like, my dad used to have direct TV when it wasn't, like, legal. Yeah. Yeah, so he yeah. had the action That's channel. What? Yeah, yeah. You know what's up. <laughs> you know what's yeah. up. Yeah, so I used oh, to watch yeah. 
I used to watch the action channel. So people would be like, so you know, it's funny. Everyone used to have YTV. Oh, fuck. Dragon Ball Z went back to the episode one after Vegeta sacrifices himself. Meanwhile, yeah. I have Toonami with all that US episodes. And I'm like, Haha. Yeah. it's like I'm playing chess. Y'all playing checkers on YTV. And then uh, that ended. Then there was the action channel, which had like a, adult anime. So my dad is like, so he's just watching fucking cartoons meanwhile i'm watching heads getting chopped off there's like there's like scenes of like there's like scenes of nudity so it's like oh, you have so your much. the other 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 stuff nudity too man like the rhymes with grape you know there was some crazy shit in these fucking animes that it's like jesus i'm 12 years old watching this like good lord yeah yeah aging us it ages you mentally fast it's fucking right it does <laughs> Yes, man. It really does. Uh, <laughs> That's crazy that you went to BTT as well, what you were saying. So, and Xavier too, uh, that, yeah, I can shout out to Xavier for the UAE title. He's defending fight. his title. Fights tomorrow, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, 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 really excited for this fight. He's hyped. He feels good. I'm excited for him. It's, uh, there's some good beef between the two guys. So, really? Yeah, they've been, they've been like beefing for months and months. One dude, he slapped him on the way in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he slapped X. So it's going to be, it's, 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 there's no respect whatsoever. This is just going to be an absolute, like, shit kicking brawl. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. I hope X can win it, man, you know, because he's on such a roll right now. And what he's doing too with putt with the, kit with uh punch 360 like so this win is just gonna help him not only like to get to the bigger leagues but just having a belt in any organization whether it's big or small it, it helps build your brand as like a personal trainer and what he does too absolutely i mean the cool the, and the good thing with it with with x is he doesn't it's great to have but he doesn't need it he's such a good dude he's such a good person like that gym that he runs, they, they've done such amazing things in such a short period of time. You know, it's, it's three young dudes who've never owned a business before in their life. And they went in and from start to finish, they've just killed it. And I'm, I'm just super, super proud of those boys because I've known them forever. I've known all three of them forever. Josh, I've Matt, and him. And I've known them, you know, forever. And it's great to see people not just do martial arts – and enjoy because because everyone enjoys doing them. If you do them, it's so hard that you must enjoy doing it. Otherwise, you wouldn't do them. First of all, so for to see them take what they love so much and turn it into a way to make a living, it's it's the dream for all of these guys. You know, I get asked all the time, like, how do I get into coaching? Or I'd like to get in coaching. What do you think? Or all, all the time, you know, or you're just so lucky. You're so lucky you get to coach all day. Or you get to, you're so lucky. Da da da, and. It's a lot of people would love to do this because they love martial arts so much, but it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So to see them do that and succeed and do so well, and it's great. I'm really, really happy for them. And he's a, he gets the belt because he's a fucking champion. You know, the, the guy works so damn hard. And he's, he's, a, he's a true fighter. A lot of guys, they like to say they're fighters. They like to say they, they fight, but X is hard. Like this kid is hard. He's made of, of granite. He's, He's hard and he likes to fight. So, yeah. It's like Dana White said, you know, do you want to be a fighter? It's not just about, you know, signing pictures, banging broads and, you know, going out binging and, and X puts the work exactly. in. That's the thing. Like, and then when you tell people you do martial arts, like if, like, I'm sure you've heard it too. They're like, it's like, oh, you do martial arts. Like the, you hit, you get that stupid thing. Like, oh, I bet I could fight you. It's like, okay. It's like, okay. It's, yeah. It, you, you get those guys. You get those guys uh, or like, you know, I don't need to train, man. <sighs> when, I, <laughs> when it's go time, I just see red. You know? <laughs> I'm like, okay, bro. Okay. Yes, you do. Yeah, you yeah. See, that, that's you. That's all you, man. That's cool. Jeez. And the, the crazy thing is like in these situations, of anyone who trains, my, even myself, if I find myself in this situation, I'm not seeing red. I'm like, all right, you guys can fight. I'm going home. I just turn around and walk away. Like, Unless it's someone I love, I know being assaulted or myself in self-defense terms, like, I'm not going to put myself, I'm not getting paid. I'm not going to fight in the street. Get the fuck out of here. 
Yeah, exactly. Like there's like, I was in, um, cause the thing is too, with social media too now, other than cancel culture, like social media gave a pair of brass balls to everybody, whether you're a dude or a woman, like I have to call, I have to call what it is. I'm sure you would agree. And it's then this not. chat room on clubhouse, this guy, D one basketball player. Hey, uh, Drew, uh, I see you, you got like a trophy there and you're wearing a boxing sweat, a boxing sweater, bro. I played D one basketball. I bet if we were in a fight, I could, I bet I could fucking crack you. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh really i'm like uh I'm like do you want to be nate robinson do you remember what happened to nate robinson beautiful example beautiful example against an absolute terrible human being good lord big paul this guy you know if he gets hit by a bus i'd celebrate it I, i'm sorry i fucking hate this guy everybody does everybody it's does. nuts who are, <sighs> Who would have thought the entire MMA community would be rooting for fucking Ben Askren to beat someone up? When it gets to that point, you know you're a scumbag. And the, the kid is a scumbag. Ugh. He's just ruining boxing. Like, I mean, because you have to understand, because it's so crazy how, like, before, back in the day, boxing was bigger than MMA. But then, day, then after that, Zufa comes in, they get tough, and they turn it around. And now everybody's watching MMA more than boxing. So boxing did it to themselves with all the politics they have. Oh, for sure. And, and just <laughs> how corrupt <laughs> that sport has become. And... And lackluster because of the four thousand weight categories. I don't know. It's who knows. But right. But but quite honestly, though, right now boxing is coming back a bit. Like, in, it, there's a lot. In, like, there's a lot of good boxers out there these days. That there's so, there's quite a few interesting fights. That if you ask me five years ago, like, do you watch boxing? I'd be like, no, like, I don't. Like, I, I just, there's nothing for you, me to watch. Like, I'm just not interested, you know? But I've watched, in the past year and a half, two years, I've watched more boxing than I did in the last 10 years. I'll put it that way. Same. Yeah, because I mean, because I got into MMA only in 2015. So when people ask me, is GSP your favorite fighter? Like, as, as controversial as it is, I always say, like, well, not really, because I, I only got into it when he left after yeah. the Hendrix fight. Yeah, like, it's, so when you I got have, in. The same effect on you. What? It won't have the same effect on you when you, when after the, you know? No, because, like, that was a big thing, I remember, like, and in 2014, like, I always, because I use, this is where I use my history degree, like, thanks, mom, and thanks to my mom and dad for putting me through university, in a sense, and then using that degree to do MMA history, you know, I'm not paid for it, but it's okay, they, they, they it's okay, they, they, I'm just joking. I studied history as well. Get the fuck out! That what kind of history? Th- what? More like ancient civilizations. Nice. I did like modern European, especially like the Cold War, because like my, I'm half Iranian and Russian. <laughs> okay. So that was my specialty. But then like, you know, I wanted to be a history teacher. But you know, thing is, when you want to advance it, like you have to have a certain grades. And then like, I didn't meet the criteria. But there was just, there was good reasons. But you know how the schools are, Rob. They're like, Oh, you need to really. So you know what? Yeah, I, I know. I'm, well, I'm happy. Good. That's all that matters, my man. Being happy is all that matters. We're on this planet for like, 60 to 80 years it's so nothing like just be fucking happy that's all that matters nothing nothing else matters you know i meet so many people i'm sure you have it too as a coach like because you know it's like it's like especially because like you know your tristar is like so i live in ndg code st luke there's a lot of like lawyers doctors like you know like yeah. people my age and they're not happy in their careers like i hate to say it like i always like they, they, they yeah. tell me like like they're like oh you know i only did this because my parents you know wanted me it's like because it's for sure it's, that's the thing and you know sure. my luckily we have you and me had parents they're like just do what you want you know as long as you're not dead scamming people hurting others we don't care my it took my parents quite a bit of time my dad engineer he has his own company a window company my mom is a nurse they, they both have like established careers they're both catholic they're both very like to the book and like i broke the mold so hard like coming out of the fucking gates that like by age 12 i was just everything they weren't and i didn't give a shit i never did i was always doing my own thing and i truly didn't give a shit so like i started grooming them let's say from a from a young age for them to understand that listen i wasn't gonna do what you want me to do and it took a really long time but by the time i was done school and like when I decided to move here, they were in full, full support. They moved me here and they supported me in every single way. They would fly to all my fights. 
They would always come. My brothers, my sisters would come. My dad would fly. My dad probably saw all my fights. He would fly to wherever I was fighting. He would nice. Come. Like they were always so crazy supportive. And they, and to this day, they're always insanely supportive. As long as I'm happy, they don't give a shit. So I got super, super lucky in that sense because it's not the case. I know, I know grown adults well into their late twenties, thirties who are still super, super scared of how anything they do, how their parents are going to react to that or the backlash that's going to happen. Or I yeah. can't do this simply because my parents will da da da. I'm like, my God, this is insane. Like you need to live your life for yourself. You're as much as I, as much as you can love your parents, they are not living that life for you. Like you're just not going to be happy. It's that exactly. simple. You know? Yeah. Like after like, so after like my dad, like at first I had like a very, cause like my parents were divorced. So my stepmom is very like laissez faire, you know, like she doesn't care really. Cause you know, it's like, Cause like, you know, it's like, it's, I'm not like her kid by birth, but she just wants to make sure that I'm like, you know, that like I'm doing good. My dad, uh, like was very liberal. My mom was very over, overprotective, but after like my dad passed, like my real mom was like, my biological mom was like, look, she's like, do what you want. Just make sure you're, if you're happy, I'm happy. So she's like, I just don't like it when you compete in your tournaments. Cause I don't want you to get hurt. But she's like, if it makes That's them it. happy, she's like, I can't say anything. My mom was the same way. She, she would come to the fights, but she never watched actually. My yeah. mom never can't watch me fight she couldn't watch me fight she came to one fight and she watched it like this through her <laughs> hand that was that yeah it's but sucks. super supportive that's all that matters right exactly yeah i know like she loves like the show i do she's like i see you doing it you know she's like you're doing great and yeah like uh so that's uh so that's what i meant if you if your parents like are happy with it and like and you know they see that you're happy that's the i think that's the best thing that could ever happen for anybody because yeah. i mean like I, as I said, you've seen it too, I'm sure, like when you train people, like not only as a coach, like when you're coaching amateurs, but just people who come in to train, like, you know, with you as like, just to stay in shape. And you could probably see it in their face, like jobs worn down, they're not happy with themselves. And, you know, like it's, it's just must, it must suck. Like <laughs> big time. They feel trapped, right? They feel trapped. They feel like they, they're stuck in, in this job, maybe they, they probably have a family. They probably have bills to pay. They probably feel like, oh my gosh, I can't go anywhere. I have to support these people and whatnot. Um, yeah. And, and also, you know, the pressure society puts on everyone to essentially value money over happiness. You're going to have these, these workers, you know, and also the school system, right? It doesn't build, uh, doesn't build boxes and build workers. Exactly. So, like it, like you, did, you have like, slaves just running through the mill and when i um, honestly though when i have these these types of clients if i if if at any time they start complaining about anything i just tell them to shut up because i have them for one hour and i don't want to hear about the outside world you have a lot of coaches that act as therapists and i do not i i don't i don't want to hear what you have to say at all like I don't, you don't have to say anything, but okay. And nod your head because I'm going to give you instructed and you just listen because there's a, there's two reasons to this one. I want to take you away from that for this one hour to allow you not to have to think about these troubles. But two is if you're complaining the whole time, you're probably not focused and probably not learning. So right. you're probably not going to enjoy what you're doing in the long run because you're probably not going to feel you're not progressing at all. Versus the complete opposite, you just focus for that hour, you're going to actually learn because you're going to train properly and you're going to feel like you're progressing. Therefore, you're going to enjoy the training. Therefore, you're going to enjoy that hour away from all this crap and it'll be more of a happy cycle instead of a vicious cycle. It's super true. Like, I mean, when I'm with my coach, uh, like I don't train a trash, I go to a gym out east because like I do karate and it's like when I'm with my coach, like... We don't talk. I, I never complain. The only thing we talk about, like when we're taking breaths, is like, oh, did you hear about what happened in the news, like with MMA, like that kind of stuff? Because that's like yeah. got to do, and that's positive. Because then that's we fine. have laughs. Yeah, like that. That and that keeps me focused. Because you know, like when I have an obsession, I have a very obsessive personality. Like with things, like when I get on something, it's like it's full steam ahead. Like it, there's no ifs or buts. The only way to get good at something too, though, got to jump in, man. Otherwise. You know, you may, you may get like decent at it, but if you really want to like get good at something, anything, right. You gotta, you gotta practice. You gotta love it too. There's a lot of key, there's a lot of factors into mm -hmm. 
great at something, but loving it and practicing a lot is, is that your cat? Is that your cat there? Yeah, it's my cat. Nice. It's cool. You right. can bring him in. Yeah, let's let's make your cat famous for a day. Hello. What's his name or her name? His name is Jin. Hi. Oh, like Jin Kazama. Like Jin. <laughs> yeah. Like a Japanese Jin. Yeah. Nice. But, so. He's well groomed. You you you. Yeah groomed. yeah. I yeah, don't do. He's super chill. Because <laughs> I saw him running across the screen. I was like, "Oh, he's a ninja. He's like he's like uh, he's like you. He's like a ninja." Hey, Jin. <laughs> I used to have a dog. So I used to have a dog, but cats are uh, cool too. I, I love I love all animals. I don't have space for a dog, nor the time. It's like having a child. Yes, that is true. Cats are more independent. I, I mean, but the one thing I, I that's a no no for me are spiders and like bugs and stuff. Like, that's like a that look. I understand if you have a hamster, a rabbit, but if someone says, "Hey, I have a tarantula," I'm like, "Why keep that thing away from me?" I'm because I yeah, I just no. Yeah, I don't know about I don't mind them, but I don't know about them as pets either. I don't know how people. Uh, I'll look at them from a distance, yeah. not as yeah. a pet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I saw eight legged freaks, man. That eight legged freaks to ten, man. That that shit scared the shit out of me. So, yeah. But uh, who are your fighters that got you into MMA? Like, you know, like like the one when you when you started like uh, getting into it. Like, because when you got into it, like this was in, during the Wild West days, like when Tito and Chuck were the face of MMA, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, damn. Who who are the good guys back then? Uh, man, it's it's so long ago. I have to say, like my earliest recollection of like starting to like really follow actual fighters and and like start following them. I'd say maybe like Jose Aldo, mm -hmm. like Young Cub, Young Cub Swanson, because they're all guys my weight. I I I always liked fighters my own weight, like 35, 45, 55s. The, the bigger guys, I can't really relate to them. So I never really like followed them or like, like them as much. I always enjoy watching all of them. Mm -hmm. My favorite divisions are the 35, 45, 55 division. Super technical. Yeah. Really technical. And it's just, it's more like, like I said, I can relate to, to how they're moving and how the training is and, um, and then guys, my training partners are fighting and I'm watching them. So it's like, you know, I can, it's, it's more like that, but, uh, shit, who else? Those, 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 those are very good picks though, by the way. I really, I really like that. They're, they're two of my, fa I just, they were two of my favorites. They were really, really, really dynamic. And man, I honestly, I've been, I've been following and a huge fan of Dustin Poirier like the minute he got into the UFC, because I remember when he came to Montreal and fought Derek Gauthier, because I was training with Derek and he knocked Derek out in the first round oh. and HBO was following him around doing a special on him. You can still watch the special on HBO. I forget what it's called, but you can Google it and find it. I think it's on YouTube and it's like a young Dustin Poirier and the end of that documentary is the fight in Montreal and he knocks out Gauthier. And at that time, they're advertising Gautier as the next GSP. And it's like this huge battle. They bring him in. And then if, if Derek would have won that fight, he would have went to the UFC. But Dustin won that fight, and he went to the UFC. That was his ticket in. And then after that, it was just, you know, kind of history mm -hmm. with him. But I remember watching that and being like, Jesus Christ, this guy's a savage of a fighter. And... He was always so entertaining and always a good dude. So you know, I, I like I like good guys. Like in terms of, especially back in the day, mm -hmm. I was all about like respect and that, all, all that stuff. You know, <laughs> back in the day. Now, now I love Connor. Like, yeah. like straight up. Like I, like I love I love Connor. He's just he's he's crazy, but I love the way he fights and. I see. I, I can agree. For me, it was, um, as mentioned, I mean, I know it's an unpopular choice. Many First, it was John Jones for me because I watched him fight DC in January 2015. But what really got me into martial arts, there was other two. It was Gegard Mousasi and Stephen Wonderboy nice. Thompson. 
amazing. Oh, another one for me was uh, it was actually um, he fought George. What was his name? Brazilian. Uh, uh, Alves. Nago Alves. Yeah, I just love like because because I was originally doing Muay Thai. My first, so I got I went from like a Muay Thai striker into MMA, and I just I just loved like his leg kicks and and he was just like a juiced up Brazilian that was just smashing shit he was a savage man I, I loved his style of fighting and dan hardy too like young dan hardy i thought he was like really badass he was cool i liked his like traditional background too in martial arts i liked how he was like a monk and shit and it was cool i like that those were the good days. I feel like I feel like the golden age of MMA for me was the blow up of tough in 2005. And then up to, I would say 2014, because as mentioned, George left at the end of 2013. So if you remember, like there's five really big pay-per-views. The first one was, uh, there was like John Jones Gustafson. Then it was Kane versus JDS, the trilogy. Then it was yeah. like, jo- which one? Brock Lesnar and, uh, who was it? Carwin or Overeem? It must have been Carwin. It was the one that held like the, the highest pay-per-view at one point. It was it was that one. I think it was that one in UFC 100, which George thought, fought Tiago as a co-main. It's the only time George yeah. has ever been on a co-main. And, and, yeah. no one, and it's like a fun little fact there. That That is uh, interesting, eh? That's the only time. That's crazy. Who was the main event? Lesnar and Mir. You at Lesnar and Mir, the second fight. That's right. That's right. Lesnar had that famous quote. He's like, I'm drinking a Bud Light because Coors Light ain't paying me enough. And then he's like, and he like, he was just like, he had like that one part where he, after he he fucks up and he goes up to the cage and you see him like drooling with his mouthpiece. He's just like banging on the fence. I think yelling at Dana. It's like, this guy's madman, but I fucking love it. (laughs) <laughs> one of my favorite moments is when he leaves the cage and Undertaker's doing an interview and Undertaker's like you want to go? <laughs> Have you seen that? No, I don't, I don't watch WWE but is it one that I should like It's not a WWE, is that, a, is that an MMA? Is that a Are you serious? It's oh my Leaving the cage after a fight, he's walking and, I, and Undertaker is giving an interview to, to fucking help. I think it's Errol Hawani. He's giving it. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. I and I don't take it. Just mid interview, just stops and looks at him. You want to go? <laughs> and then goes right back to the interview. It's so fucking awesome, man. That, that is one of the greatest fucking moments. Oh. That was a good card. I think that Lesnar uh, Carwin card was amazing, just for the sport in general. Chris Lieben. I don't know if you remember Chris Lee. I'm sure you remember Chris Lieben. <laughs> How could you not remember Chris fucking Lieben? Jesus Christ! What a what what a what a showman that guy was. He was. I'll, I'll never forget when he beat uh, Akiyama. Like, and after that, like he's just like pumping the crowd up. Like the, all the post fight interviews after that card were like amazing. Like, and just I always say UFC 116 was super important for MMA history. Whether you love or hate Brock, that elevated the sports to another level. Oh, I like Brock. I like what he did. The guy was nuts. I like. He didn't even. He didn't even like train MMA like at all all of a sudden he's just like pro wrestling forever decides to start MMA and like actually does well doesn't look like a doesn't look like CM Punk like doesn't actually looks like a fighter like I I had no issue with that at all because like he went in there he beat some guys he lost some some guys he he won the belt for Christ's sakes like that's impressive (laughs) and like heavyweight belt like yeah he was juggernaut lead juiced out of his mind like but like <laughs> whatever everyone was at that time so whatever oh it, it, it's yeah. true it's true you got yeah was, and I, I that was when i was like a really 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 fringe casual fan because i like i'd see it in like new stuff i follow up but then i would never get the pay-per-view but then after yeah. 2015 i started to really follow it more and now you know then i got the visual history book of all the history since 1993 to like then 2015 so i nice. got caught up yeah that's so that's that's why like when people be like you know so much and i tell them yeah i only got into 2015 and they're like how do you know so much it's like i use my history degree to get the book and then i got fight pass i invested in it 
Yeah, that's a good book, man. I should get that too. My goal is to get it autographed. Like I have it autographed by George because his wrestling coach, Misha, used to come to my old job to buy food. And I used to like, and Misha was like, saw me once wear like a boxing sweater. And he's like, he told me what he does. And I said, I said, oh, I have a book, the visual book. Can you like get George to sign it? Got George to sign it. So shout out to Misha for signing, getting it signed. The next up is David Loiseau, who uh, is going to sign it. Then I'm going to get Gay Guard, his manager, because I had his manager on my show. So when nice. I, yeah, they're going to like that. I, I want. Gay guard. <laughs> he's amazing. I think he's one of the best middleweights that no one talks about. I, I, I think he's like top two. I like you, Rob. Someone who agrees with me because people like always be like, no, no. They're oh like, my, no. Come on. It's like, it's like Lima as well. Like, yo, Lima is, I think, in the top five fighters on the planet. Like, the guy, the guy is an absolute savage technician just amazing fighter yeah him and Gegard, dude him and Gegard, they just fly under the radar because they don't give a shit no but they truly don't give a shit they're getting taken care of and they don't give a shit you know i just think they're very like what we were what one idea for the podcast that we were supposed to do before the pandemic hit because the lima musasi fight happened like so late uh like one idea was like sandro was gonna shout out shout out to sandro for one of the ogs of the show like sandro's been on my show like a few times so sandro was gonna come on and it was in the works to try to get faraz on so what they would do if, to break down that fight like i would ask sandro tell me why douglas lima can win this fight with his striking and then i'd ask faraz tell me why gegard would win this fight with his iq and his grappling because everyone sleeps on gegard's grappling so that's where it would have been interesting to pick the two minds to see like why they think each has a chance to win yeah it's a it's it, it was an interesting fight on paper and just in terms of both of their histories like just being able to watch so much tape on them you know everyone just kind of expecting a banger, but everyone, like you said, they sleep on Gegard's grappling. His his wrestling is nuts. Once he gets a hold of you, he's just like relentless. He's relentless. He's gonna take you down somehow. Sometimes it's beautiful. Sometimes it's ugly as shit. But like, and then once his it's like his top pressure, his half guard top pressure is. Yeah, the guy's a. He's, and it's just he's a savage. He's a straight up savage, and he's a savage when he talks. I love him because of his personality too. Like, I love, he truly does not give a fuck at all. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's the one that got me into MMA because my dad is like half Iranian. So when I saw him with that style, and how many people know this? Like, he beat Tiago Santos easily. Lord John Jones yeah. had to take him to decision. No problem. Hey, starch Tiago, you know that. Only real, only real G's know that fact. <laughs> yeah, the guy. I mean, I I know that's why he he he, just, he doesn't give a shit about the UFC be, because he's getting taken care of. So mm-hmm. he doesn't care where he's fighting. He's that type of person where he doesn't need like the fame of having a UFC glove on his hand to like feel valued. Like he was there, done that. They didn't give a shit about him, and. Now he's just loving it. Killing it in Bellator. He's, he's got the belt. He's got a good life. You know, he's, he's very well off. Like, I'm going to be honest. Like, I always he's, tell people, if you're a fighter, look at him as an example. He took all his money, put it in good investments. That too, right? Th- that's another important thing. Not all fighters are smart enough to take that next step to invest properly. But at least he's able to get taken care of while he's... Mm-hmm getting the shit kicked out of him and vice versa because so many guys are just foregoing the the money or the prestige of not fighting the UFC to fight for the UFC and are making pennies, absolute pennies. It is so sad. It is so sad. Like, I, personally, I fucking hate Dana White. I think Dana White is a scumbag. He is a dirty, dirty scumbag. And I think each, they truly don't give a shit about, like, all their fighters. They care about a few of them. That make money. If they have to be making money. Like, why do you think Matt Vidal's getting all the love now? Because he's making the company money. So Exactly. Um, because there's so many guys that will, oh, I don't want to take this fight or whatever the case may be, or I can't fight or I can't make the weight or, okay, no problem. 
they call up this guy, this guy, this guy, and they'll take that fight like this, no problem with a shitty pay because there's so many guys that just want to fight in the UFC. They don't care what they're getting get paid as long as they're oh, fighting in the UFC. You know? Sad. I mean, the, another guy that luckily you're working with that seems to be doing really well for himself is Kevin Lee. Like Kevin Lee like has done so well building his brand and you had the chance to work no, with him. That's it though, right? You said it. it's a brand. It's... <laughs> It's, it becomes more than – like, Connor is a brand, yeah. right? More than a fight. You have guys who are who are more than fighters who, like you said, build a brand. And that's what it's about. Like, if you want to make money for the UFC. Like, other organizations don't care, really, if you have a brand or not, to be honest. It's the UFC, do because they have such a platform that they the drama just creates more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could – it's very true. And with Kevin Lee, I mean, Kevin Lee, like when, when I saw him at TriStar the time I came, like I saw you and him bond really well and he's done so well, not only like as a fighter, but like he's doing media, like he gets, he's using that to his advantage, like to go around building his brand, but he does a lot of work in Michigan for kids in Michigan, where he's from too, which not many people know about. And, you know, like he likes to keep that under the radar, which is like cool. Cause you know, some people want to always get the credit, but he likes to keep it humble. What is it like working? with uh, Kevin because I think he is a dark horse if uh, when he's when in that division it's just that it's so stacked but I think he really does have like the acumen to be like a top two fighter if not like a contender and potentially champion yeah Kev's a special guy he really is there's not not just in terms of uh athletics because that's where he excels even more the guy's just like a, a natural athlete times a hundred, you know, times a hundred. One of those guys where it's like he got superpowers one day and like he punches through a wall and doesn't realize he can punch through walls kind of deal. Like he just, he doesn't realize his truly what he can do. And then, <laughs> and, and some days he does. And uh, I don't know. Like I, I love the guy. I love the guy to death. I, I love Kevin Lee to death. We became really close. And we did a lot of stuff outside of of training together, you know, like I, I, I hung up with him like almost every day, you know, when, he, when he's in town and he's a special dude. And like when I go to Vegas, I hang out with him all the time. He shows me around. We go places and he, like you said, he could be number two. He could be number one. He could be champion. He really could. It's just Kevin Lee's biggest opponent is Kevin Lee. and. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't. I've only known him for a few years now. You know, I've I don't. I haven't known him for for a super long time. But um, he's got such a big heart, like you said, with all the kids working with the kids and all these things. Like he took me to Brazil with him for the one media day. The one like we went for, to Brazil for one day. Like we just you know, it's like you want to come to Brazil. I'm like, yeah, let's go. You just went to yeah, Brazil. Yeah, I remember. That was like right when the pandemic began. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For one day, we were in Brazil literally for t- less than 24 hours. 22 hours we were in the country <laughs> and we came back. Um, he's such a good dude. Um, and and I and I really hope that he can come back and, and train more with us and get influenced more by Fraz and the rest of the guys and, and find like a really – like kind of stable, stable team to work with to kind of mold him to because he is so coachable. It's unbelievable. Like it, you you tell him like jump off the bridge. He just says yes sir. Like he says yes sir to everything. He won't question anything. He'll work for four hours straight. Like it, it's crazy how like people think oh he like from his attitude he must be so uncoachable. He must you know you'd be like. Um, and it's the complete opposite in the gym like once he starts training he is so serious he just just will work and put in extra reps and extra time and 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 work 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 it's crazy he really he really works like like a savage he makes those around him better because when i was there that january he you said extra reps he was like testing uh javid to the iranian because like there's you guys have some iranians thanks to pj and yeah. uh, he was and javid was like 
doing extra with him. And that just shows like he it's so I think like when people say all oh, the attitude, I think he just puts that up as a front. So people don't take advantage of him. And I'd be the same way too, because like sometimes I like to act a bit weird just so people don't take advantage of me because you know, like there are people have agendas and you don't want to get caught up in their bullshit. And I think Kevin does a great job at that. They don't even, they don't know where he's from either. Like yeah. Another cool thing we have in common is, like, you grew up in Detroit. I'm from Windsor. It borders with Detroit. Like, I grew up in Detroit. We were there every weekend. Concerts. Like, I've seen every damn concert known to mankind. Like, we grew up there at all the sporting events, partying downtown. Like, and he's from there. And this place is, like, it is hard. Like, it's Detroit. We all know about Detroit. Like, if you, you need to have that. If you don't have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, like you said, they will take advantage of you. But, like, They'll take everything from you, like your mm-hmm. wallet, your fucking shoes, and like everything. Like, so it was tough. He doesn't come from this like super easy fucking suburban upbringing into an MMA fighter because he started with karate as a kid. Like, like no man, this guy, like he, and he made it, and he moved his whole family from Detroit to Vegas. Like, bought them a house, moved his whole family there. Like, like he's good people. Him and, and his brother, Keith, who I fucking love as well. Like, Keith Lee is an amazing human being. They're both, they're both amazing. They do so much for their family. And, yeah, he's got to be like that. But he's like that for the camera. He's like that for, for, for the show. Connor's like that for the show. Guys are like that for the show, you know. And, but when it comes time to work, he works. He works really hard, you know. And I... I Listen, Charles Oliveira is – he should be fighting for the title. Obviously, he is. They announced it like today or yesterday. Yeah. It's about time. The guy is – like you said, the vision is crazy stacked. This, this guy should be fighting for a title. So, like, if Kev would have beat him, again, he would have been right back into title contention. Yeah. So, it's like, yes, he's been out. His knees fucked him up. But he's back. He's feeling better. He's – you know, post surgery, he's back to training. He's in a good place mentally as well. Um, so yeah, 20, 2022, end of 2021, 2022 could be interesting for, for him. It's just he's got to find a good routine for training and he's got to find that good balance. Um, it's just, he's just got to get back to Montreal, honestly, because it was a good place for him. It was away from a lot of distractions. Mm-hmm. He was just really, you know, he would come to the gym, we would train, go eat, we would train. You go back to play Call of Duty at night. He's back in the gym in the morning. You know, there's no fucking around. He's not in Vegas. He's not, you know, it. And look, I mean, look what happened after that camp. Like, Gregory Gillespie, he almost killed the motherfucker. And. Were you there? Were you at MSG for, I hope you were at MSG for that. No. (laughs) Ah. Nah, bro. No, I was at a bar and I lost my mind. I lost my mind when that happened. I think that's one of the best MSG cards that the UFC did. Cause I think the best MSG cards are obviously the first one, 205 Connor Alvarez, Woodley Thompson, Joanna Kolokowicz. The year exactly. after GSP thug growth, the 2018 yeah. one was a big blip on the radar. Cause they just couldn't find anyone. It was the Lewis DC. And let's yeah. be honest, not well, many people like DC. I mean, look, maybe you do, but yeah. I mean, it's, I, I didn't like DC when he fought. I like DC now. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my consensus of him. <laughs> You're not the only one that says that. Like, I think nope. he's a great commentator. Yeah, I love the dude as a commentator, and I like him and Ariel. I like him and Bisbig when they're together. I like him and Dom when they're together. I it's I I have no, and I can't even tell you why I didn't like him when he fought. Maybe because he was like an emotional bitch. I don't know. I don't know if that's why, but maybe. <sighs> It's like he was emotional, and I liked watching John Jones beat him up. Yeah. I, I, I don't, and I don't even like John Jones. You do. So yeah. I understand why you like that. But, like, yeah. I, really, I, I like to watch John Jones fight. So I guess it wouldn't have mattered who he was beating up. But since he was beating up this guy who was crying, it's just like I like to watch people get beat up like that. Like, mm-hmm. like shut the fuck up. Fight him back. Don't cry. Like, if you cry, cry out of rage. Don't cry out of, like, sorrow. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe that's why I didn't, I didn't like him. <laughs> what, what's your opinion of, like, because I, I like Wonder Boy Thompson, too. That's, a, like, that's another one that trained at TriStar for a bit yeah. that not many people know about. Love, love, love the dude. Um, 
he okay he's just like george in this and even more in the sense where like he's just nice all the time but like overly nice like sage northcutt overly nice <laughs> yeah. o- overly like we but sage northcutt is weird overly nice yeah wonder boy is normal overly nice good yeah. such a such a good dude crazy crazy his dad too crazy Oh, like the Ray's like a Ray. I think Ray is one of the OGs in terms of like kickboxing for yeah. like pro kickboxing. Erica, yeah, he's yeah, without a doubt. Hey, they all know each other. Like the, like John Eve Terrio and Vic Terrio know Ray. Ray knows the the Debellas. It's like it's, it's crazy how the, how small the fight world is. Like because when I told Ray I was from Canada, he's like, you know Debella? I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, what? Yes, why? I say, well, tell Angelo. I say hi. I hope he's still rock and rolling. <laughs> yeah, kick. I mean, because kickboxing is, it's just a, it's just a, like a subculture of, of it. You know, it's like a, its own community. Kickboxing is very specific, very specific because it only had a very short-lived life. Mm-hmm. Some people had to move on and continue with a different rule set. Other people stayed with it, like Debella. You know, it's, they, they went in more of like a recreational route. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'll see what Jonathan does. I, I really want to see him fight more kickboxing. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what he does. I, I really loved watching him fight. He's, he's a great kid. I, that, I love, love that family very much. They've done such a good job for Montreal's martial arts community. Like, like amazing. It, it's amazing. like, amazing. they're just amazing. They are. So when you're, when you're working with an amateur, I mean, you know, what do you like when, when do you know you have a good one? Like, how do you, cause when you get, when they, when Faraz or let's say Jeremy, or I, I don't know how the brass works at TriStar, they have their system. They come to you, Rob, and say, Rob, we have a, we have a prospect here. He's an amateur. He wants to get good. What, like, what, like, how do you know when you have a good one you feel that you can work with? First, first thing we look for is just, so we ask our amateur fighters to train every night. They don't have to we, – we, normally the pros train during the – before COVID, pre-COVID training was pros always train in the afternoon and they always come back for a second session at night. And our amateurs, we ask them to be there at least four nights a week. If you're in camp, five for sure um, because we run like striking, grappling, striking, Monday striking. Tuesday grappling, Wednesday striking, Thursday grappling, and then Friday like a sparring. Um, so if you're on the amateur team and you're in camp or you're close to competing or you're on the team itself, you're expected to be there you know, regularly for those trainings. If you come to us and you're like, okay, listen, I want to start fighting for you guys and da-da-da-da-da, we say, great, this is the schedule, start coming. And that's the first thing. They just have to start coming. Like, because everyone wants to fight. Everyone says they want to fight. Everyone's excited about the prospect of fighting, which is really cool. But it, the fight is, you know, 1%. It's the last, uh, the last day, let's say. Day, day one is coming to the gym and then showing up for day two and day three and not stopping for day four through day 12 and showing up on day 13 again. No, it's like you're there every day. And when your face becomes known around, the coaches will start knowing your names, knowing who you are, and will gradually just start working with you because at TriStar, this is what I really love about this place is there's, you know, there's no drama. There's no, like, bullshit. There's, it's just work. Like, it's just work. It's just, you know, there's no fucking around. We laugh and we have fun before and after training, but when it's time to train at the gym, you know, there's, it's, it's really, really serious. It's really good work. Even like at night when it's like, Monsieur, Madame, tout le monde, regular people are, are there, but our amateurs are there and our pros are there. Everyone's training together. Um, and that's why it's not always the best gym in terms of just pure recreational martial arts training, because you're always going to be surrounded by high level athletes pushing themselves. So if that makes you uncomfortable, you know just be be ready for that you know there's a there's it's it's intense and since the coaches are there to put in work we're not there to waste any time when we see guys showing up every day willing to do that work that we're putting them through that's when you you gain that kind of mutual respect and 
you start realizing, okay, this person is serious. They're willing to make the sacrifices it takes to put the hours in on the mats, but also to do the weight cut, to do, to help other training partners, to, to be part of the team. You know, you step in the cage by yourself, but it's definitely a team sport, you know, besides, besides fight night. So when you see the person just showing up and, and working hard with a good attitude, you know, not, not being an asshole, not trying to hurt people, not, uh, not being too aggressive, listening, being coachable, you know, just listening to little things. It's just, it's just little things when, when they, when they just say yes or okay, instead of yeah, but, or, or yeah, you know, yeah, there's all that. There's always the yeah, but guy, like, I don't want to hear about the yeah, but it's just like, just do it what we tell you to do. And so it, there's these little things. And when, when you, when you, when you see those little things, you know, okay, now we can start working on just the progression technically wise, because mm-hmm. that's going to, you start showing up you're going to progress it's pretty it's, it's pretty simple especially at tristar the, the level is so high that you have no choice and, and it's so inclusive too because i was talking with when i had jeremy rubin on my show i was really congratulating him on the wimp to warrior because i said you have no idea like how much good you're doing with that program because like because there's a lot because martial arts is very inclusive i mean it's not to sound social justice here but you know what i liked about that program wimp to warrior was getting people on like that have special needs to like build their confidence through martial arts and i think that's what tristar does a good job at did you have any involvement with wimp to warrior too we had three seasons mm-hmm. or two. I'm not sure how the third season panned out. Um, I was actually the head coach for the first season on one of the teams. So it was myself and Joe Jonathan Goulet. Mm-hmm. We were the, the two head coaches. And then we had like PJ and the other coaches helping us underneath. But at the end of the, for when they fight each other, it was myself and Joe who was the head coaches there. So that was, that was very interesting and not to uh, not to boast, but I'd say the first season was the best season. We we killed it on that season. It was good. I I enjoyed it. Um, I have a few suggestions or recommendations I would have for the program in itself, all in all. But I think it's a great program. I think it's amazing. Um, I would have even more better things to say about it. I think if I was a morning person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hate it. I hate it. That was that was more of like a challenge for myself getting up that early and training that early because like wow that was that was an intense six months it was crazy but the people it was amazing it was amazing there was it was it was <laughs> yeah it was and, and i was not i was not nice like at all for that for that program like i i have so much respect for these guys that fight mma that like i used to fight mma and these guys that still fight mma and i still spar on saturdays with the pros what we do is so hard this is not a game you know it's not a sport i'm sorry it's a sport so we can do it we say it's a sport but this is not a sport we're fighting this is a, this is a livelihood yeah martial arts are a livelihood in itself but like what we're like a fight like the mma one thing to train them but like to actually fight it's a whole nother ball game and I wanted to make sure that these people were coming in here and they wanted to, I want them to realize it wasn't a joke. Like this, this is not just like going in and slapping each other. Like, and no, like I'm going to put you through the ringer every morning. Like you're making me be here at like fucking 6 AM. No problem for the next hour and a half. I will murder you because that's what you're going to try to do to that person or what they're going to try to do to you. This is how it works. This is how we train MMA. This is how an MMA fight works. This is how you know. This is how it is. It's not. It's not ballet and it's not baseball. They're all difficult in their own respective ways. But this is MMA and this is a completely different ball game. So I did that every morning for six months. I beat the absolute shit out of these people, and the level actually was very good at the fights after six months. I think it's a little too short to have an actual MMA fight at the end of six months with zero prior knowledge. Yeah. I think six months is enough time to do a boxing fight or a, a Muay Thai fight, something along those lines. MMA is a little tough because six months is, <laughs> I mean, I can work on one technique for three weeks. So like starting from scratch, that's tough. I have people that can't even like walk forward, back, left and right still in months. So like having them fight after it's, you know, it's a short, it's a short amount of time. So 
the training has to be intense and I really want to, to make them realize. And it was okay. good. Like the level ended up being really, really, really high at the end. And I was, I was impressed. I was actually very impressed with, with that. That's amazing. No, I, but what it matters is, is like, just that, like the fact is that like you kind of, and I think sometimes too, you need to have a tough coach. Like, like, I mean, <laughs> it's like, and the best, the best coaches, Rob, are the toughest ones and the toughest ones are the ones that don't say anything on fight day. The ones that have to say what they have to say in the gym. Because when I was at a karate tournament, there was like, I'll never forget this. This one coach was yelling out, what would George or Connor do in a fight? Think of what they would do. My coach looks at me. He's like, if I ever do that to you, he's like, fire me. My coach is like, my coach is like, he's like, these are weekend warriors. He's like, I fought internationally. He's like, this is not like, this is, this is amateur. He's like, this, this is real, 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 like weekend warrior shit. So yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it was cool. It was a cool experience, but like I said, I'm not a morning person, so I didn't take place the next, uh, few. It's okay. You did it. You tried that. You could it's a nice feather in your cap. Um, yeah. how do you feel when this pandemic's done? You know, I think we all have our fucking opinions of it. Mine, myself included. Cause I think the government, we have a fucked up province fucking backwards as fuck. You know, I'll say what you say. Um, when it's all said and done, how do you feel the amateur scene can recover? And with the promotions, like say MFL, like MFL is trying to like, you know, become more legitimate and hopefully the AAMQ can really get, you know, these events legalized finally, because we have an association now. So what do you think the amateur, what holds for the amateur scene with, with the, when this is all said and done, this bullshit? I hope it can get back to where it was and bigger. I hope MFL gets legit. I hope Fight Quest, I mean, still gets to put on shows and do what they do because what they do is fantastic. And what MFL does is fantastic. Like, everyone needs to, there needs to be more. There just needs to be more platforms for these guys to fight on. I don't care what the shows are anymore. Truly, I just want, like, guys to fight so they can, because amateur, it's cool you need amateur for two reasons. You need amateur for guys who want to go pro and you need amateur for people who only want to fight amateur because there's nothing wrong with that. It's amazing. It's an amazing accolade and it's amazing to do these type of competitions as you're still in great enough shape to do so because you are, because you have a competitive nature because we're human beings mm -hmm. and you don't want to go pro because you have a family and maybe kids or maybe you have a job and you love martial arts so much that you do amateur fights here and there. It's amazing. It can be done. A lot of people do it. So there needs to be that platform for both of these types of people. And there's just non-existent right now. And it's really sad. It's illegal. It's not even that it's non-existent. It's that it's illegal. It's, it's, and it's, <laughs> It's illegal for a reason. We're not going to go there because that's drama bullshit. We don't need to yeah, go there. No. Old news. That's, no, that's old news. What's important is we move forward with it. And right now we have a lot of good people trying to do so. Samuel Guia and Justin. Um, Justin from Angry Monkey. And Sam is, is from uh, Académie Frontenac. Um, Francis Duguay. Yeah. Like there, there's, there's a bunch of people that are, that are really trying to to bring it together and to make something of it. So maybe this could, because I've been in the scene for a long time, over 10 years and it's always been illegal, right? It's always been illegal, but the cops always turned a blind eye to it. Something happened. Now they don't. So it's been years that nothing's been happening. It's still illegal and people are just complaining all the time, but nothing's happening. But now that this pandemic has happened, maybe because of it, some type of coalition is going to come together and, hopefully we can legitimize this and 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 you know just give these guys these kids like a platform to fight on because other otherwise it's just we gotta travel all over the place to fight amateur and that's tough because it costs money and amateurs don't make money so so it's like, for me, like I have a full-time job and you know, yeah, I compete in karate, but if they said, Hey, you have to travel. I'd be like, uh, no, 
I'm like, um, I'm sorry. I have a, that's yeah. But I'm, I'm, re- I'm, re- we. I just want you to know, like, I'm really appreciative that we have guys like you and the others that are really being outspoken on this. And because you guys are doing amazing work, and you know, like, I always want to have amateurs on my show, like, because when people tell me I want to get into podcasting on Friday, I mean, how do I get this pro? You, you have to talk to the amateurs. I'm gonna be honest. Like, you really want to build yourself up in this game. You have to really talk to the amateurs because one day they're going to remember you and then they're going to recommend you and they remember people who give their platform. So that's why I love what I do. That I love, I love doing this because I want to give the amateurs something that they can believe in, like in themselves. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's, you have to talk to everyone. Everyone is important in the fight business. Like, it's not just the fighters. It's the coaches it's the promoters it's the journalists it's like everyone makes up the fight game without one component the the game isn't there it just it's it's all important it's all a perspective it's all it's all part of the fight game what we call the fight game you know it's you can't like you said you can't go pro before you're an amateur so the amateurs matter everyone matters it's that's what I love about this. And, you know, like, I don't think, I don't mean like, so I want to ask you this. If you didn't have martial arts where you are now, who would Rob be without martial arts? Dude, I don't know. Truly. I have no idea because I've, I've been in my mind, I've been a ninja my whole life in my, and, and I've been, I, I honestly, I live my life as a martial artist. It's a way of life. I make almost all my decisions based around martial arts. Mm-hmm. It's, and I love that. I love it. I'm so fucking happy, man. Like I'm happy. I'm happy every day. I wake up really, really happy every day. I, I'm not shy about that fact at all. I, I love what I do. And I really, I have no idea what I would be without martial arts. Someone asked me not too long ago, like what happens if you broke your legs and you couldn't do martial arts? And I had never thought about that. And, dwelling on that question like it made me sad i didn't know because because like i i can be honest with myself when i ask myself types of questions and i tried to put myself in that scenario and it like it was overwhelming at one point i just stopped thinking about it i'm like jesus like it's because it's really it's who i am you know it's a big part yeah i feel the same way i mean like i i got bit by the bug in 2015 and then I took it in 2016 with Taekwondo first. Then I got into karate, which I've been in since. And I mean, I think I'd be wasted potential. I, I really think I, I wouldn't die. I would be overweight, depressed without it. Like, you know, that, that's what I really think of. And that's why uh, it, it's given me this, like to interview people like you, Sandro and others. Uh, I practice it. I watch Fight Pass. I mean, you could ask me what happens in the news. I'm probably going to be like, I don't fucking know. But if you ask me what happens on UFC on Saturday, I could like, I could be like a fucking savant, like Rain Man. Be like, okay, well, this happened at this round in this minute. Kevin Holland fucked up Derek Brunson in the third round with like two minutes left and with a submission. That's what I remember. But if you ask me about politics, I'm probably just going to say, I don't know, but I, but I hate the curfew and the government's in Quebec is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I probably give the exact same uh, response. Exactly. All- exactly. Well, who's on your shirt, by the way? Is that like a what is it like DBZ or? No, it's Gavin Tucker. Actually, it's Gav. That's his own shirt. It says it says the governor down there. Is he a, like an artist outside of fighting? No, it's one of he's, he's a musician. Actually, he's a very talented man. Uh, it's one of his boys that designed this shirt. They did like a a, a small a small like order and and I ordered one. I didn't even like be, I didn't even, I didn't even ask him for one. I'm just like I'm just gonna order one. I went on his way and I ordered it. Yeah, man. Yeah, like uh, for me, like uh, what happened was like because I have like when you when I did my ad read, like I'm wearing like my sweater from. Uh, let me move my microphone because it's it's like so K R T Karate Tips and Tricks. So like this is like their logo, and then this is the uh, Kyokushin Kanji. So got to yes. represent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gotta support. You gotta support what you do, uh, Rob. And you know, I guess we'll we'll conclude it here. I first of all, I want to thank you for coming on finally and taking the time to come on. I really enjoyed this. It was it's gonna be. It was just. It felt like a Joe Rogan experience mixed with <laughs> hot boxing with Mike Tyson minus the smoking. But if you ever want to do round two smoking up, bro, hit me up. I'll I'll do it when we're allowed to visit each other. And where can Sounds people find? Where can people find you if they want to connect? Um, my Instagram. 
is uh, Ninja Rob MTL. That'd be the the best way to get a hold of me for sure. It's Instagram. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Got, yeah, guys. So remember, if you like this show, make sure to like, subscribe, share. I know I should have said that in the beginning, but fuck it. I'm still learning this whole podcast thing. You learn as you go. Uh, Rob, once again, thank you so much for coming on. I really hope you had a, you had a blast and it was really, yeah. really fun to like just pick your brain finally. It was awesome, bro. Thank you very much for the invite and uh, we'll definitely do it again. Anytime.